Hello, everyone. Now, it is always a sincere honor to come together with League fans around the world. And it's no different in times of heartbreak. Now, before we begin our broadcast today, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and mourn the loss of lives and those injured early this morning in Seoul, South Korea. Our condolences to the victims, their families, of course, of this horrific tragedy. And we mourn alongside the entire country of South Korea. We have the matches coming up, semi-finals. Who do you want to see win? I was here in 2016, so uh, T1 has 100% win rate with me, so I hope T1 wins. Why Gen G? Um, I like Roller, yeah. I can't wait to see another Faker outplay. That's what I'm hoping for, and I think T1's gonna take it, 3-2. Uh, I say 3-1, T1, because I feel like uh, T1's gonna end first game just to get it out of the way. And then the fans at Centennial Olympic Park have spoken, and now it's time for the pros to deliver. Welcome to World's 2022 semifinals, live from the State Farm Arena in Atlanta, Georgia. Now four teams remain in the contention for the Summoner's Cup, and today the LPL's final hope their summer champions at JD Gaming will fight for a ticket to the Grand Finals. Their opponents, though, are none other than three-time world champions T1, who themselves are looking for their fifth finals appearance. I, of course, am joined today at the State Farm Analyst Desk by Emily Cadrell and Mark Z to break down all of the semi-final action. But as we dive into this beautiful arena, welcoming the pros just moments ago as they get ready to do battle, we of course need to reflect on the quarterfinals, how we went from eight down to four. We shipped out from New York with only those four teams remaining. Let's dive into some of those quarterfinals memories. This was an absolutely insane quarterfinals. I think most people are willing to declare the best quarterfinals in world's history. The multiple five game series, even the three O's were a little bit more back and forth than you're used to seeing. And it, like, it was so hard to top that Taman Gen G series, right? But then with DRX kind of coming in, pulling off that reverse sweep against EDG on Def's birthday, like that was amazing. It was one of the best storylines I think I've ever seen in League of Legends, especially the interview afterwards was just oh, so yeah. emotional. Heartbreak for the teams that got so close, the world champions from last year getting knocked out by DRX. And of course that Damwon series was an absolute screamer, almost for pulling off that reverse sweep. So close, came down to almost a smite. Uh, yeah, I mean, so many of the series were so close. You talk about that insane three-man knockup, the insane three-man Swain <laughs> pull. You have so many team fights that were just ballistic and how close they were. And this is another one right here. Yeah, I was gonna say, and this man on our oh. screen, Zekka, oh. uh, the standout performer for DRX, which it's been really cool to see him coming into his own all season across the LCK and then being such a difference maker in that series against EDG. And of course, one of his signature champions there, the Silas, yep. as you can see, very high presence with a very solid win rate here in the quarterfinals. Again, we've isolated just records from the quarterfinals. Aatrox still unseated in that 100% presence. Uh, well, let's talk about some of the more interesting takeaways from the quarterfinal meta, Cajal. Uh Yeah, definitely. I think mid lane to me is the thing that stands out to most. These little <laughs> stick champion figurines look great, don't they? Akali and Silas are the two champions that I want to talk about because I feel like as the mid metas evolved the first time of the group stage, we saw a little bit of Azir, a little bit of LeBlanc. Lissandra was also up in there as a prior, but mm -hmm. Akali and Silas are the two most played champions of the remaining four mid laners. They either have Akali or Silas as their current most played at the tournament. So when we go into these drafts, when we go into these semis, those will be the two highest prior mid laners, which is I, so exciting. I, I love it because everyone's clearly yeah. willing to play them, and then you just have Zeka, Zeka. Have Zeka. quietly so, doubling yeah. everybody One of these else. things, not like the other. <laughs> that was because of play-ins, I believe. He had a couple in play-ins, yeah. so it's a bit skewed right, by data true, in that true. sense. But in the quarterfinals right now, in the semifinals, sorry, uh, right now, Silas Akali are the name of the game. All right, so those are the two big ticket mid laners. Emily, where are you looking? I'm going bot lane. All right, this I'm helping. Ash bot lane. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? We'll get to that. Uh, we'll get so, to that. So I think the cool thing about the Heimer Ash bot lane that we've seen is that a lot of teams have heavily prioritized having that 
that bot side push for a lot of reasons. It's kind of transitioned over from stuff like the Lucianami, which we saw from the EU teams coming into this with the, uh, the Callista as well. And then this, as the response, I hate, I'm a bot laner, I hate playing against Timer. It is so obnoxious. It makes your life miserable and you just have perma push with my, these My two. question then is, to evolve in the meta, what is the answer? These, <laughs> these are your choices, Emily. What do you think is, do you like the Nico support? Oh, yeah, like, let's it was go. Carrier can bust that out maybe. I think uh, the Soraka was a good answer. I believe EDG played that, the Sivir Soraka in, in one of their games. Think, um, is, is Zyra meant to be a response to Heimer or a replacement for Heimer? I'm not yeah, sure. Why is there a Zyra I don't know what's Nico? Going on. Gonna yeah. give you some Zyra Ash, please? Maybe these so. are like maybe hidden combos. Oh, yeah, we can, we, can, like we can marry those two together. Remember the yeah. days of that combo? Oh, yeah, God, I that's, love it. Uh, that's <laughs> old. I love it. For me, just with the matchup coming up today, though, this is kind of the like <laughs> thing looming over everyone is the Aatrox pick. It's the only 100% presence champion through groups and quarters, and with these two top laners, you know this is going to be either permaband or they're going to be taking counters into it. I was going to say, because one of my biggest curiosities is how once we hit the quarterfinals, his win rate, when he was allowed through, kind of dropped off mm -hmm. the face of a cliff, and I think it indicates, uh, again, the power of some of the top winners we have remaining in the tournament. So will he still be such a powerful pick today? Only time will tell. Let's take a look at the bracket, as we did go down from eight to four. Mark just literally <laughs> threw all of those up. Oh. I'll get him later. All right, it's JDG Intel Esports Club up against T1. Both of them had dominant 3-0 series in quarterfinals, but it was that bottom half that really delivered. 3-2 fashion for both of our series, Genji and DRX being the ones to emerge victorious. Definitely were, and now you're looking at these two teams. You've got three LCK, one LPL. The remaining hope of the LPL of China representative is JDG. It's also kind of crazy to me that this is the first time T1 at Worlds has faced an LPL team outside of RNG. They've always yeah. gone up against RNG as like the LPL team they right. were facing. So this is the first time they faced an LPL team outside of that. That's nuts. And they're also just polar opposites in terms of the matchup here today and how their orgs are respected within their communities in Korea and even worldwide. T1 is just loved almost universally. Like if anything, their fans love them too much sometimes. And they, they are so passionate in that support. Whereas JDG is the black sheep in a lot of ways of the LPL. They just have done things over the course of recent history that have rubbed fans the wrong way, starting all the way back in 2019, a Rift Rivals where they kind of dropped the ball and they did not have a great Weibo post as well afterwards. And Yagao, Kanavi, and Coach Home were all there during that time. And that's kind of lingered throughout history. And if, if there's any way to shatter that kind of belief of fans always doubting you and not having that fan base to support you, it's now. It's taking down T1. It's taking down Faker. And that's what pushes you to that next level to get those. There's no better LCK team to have to go through mm -hmm. to prove that you are deserving of being in one of those top slots. Uh, and of course, leading the charge for Faker, or for T1 is Faker. You can almost say it's, it is Faker's you team. Can, let's be real. You can hear the crowd. <laughs> I know. Just the name, just the name itself echoes throughout, not just League of Legends, but esports. And he's grown through so many different years and so many different methods and so many different players and teams surrounded by him that he's kind of adapted so many different roles throughout the years. You know, you think of 2013, 2014, 15 Faker, super hyper carry, slowly evolved into a supportive player. Now he's like a leader. Yeah, and it's really interesting to see that happen uh, in a microcosm at this Worlds too, right? We expected him to come out and play some of these more supportive picks that we've seen from him in the LCK. And it's like, nope, I'm playing a Kali and I'm just going to smash people. And that has also just been very fun to watch. And as you can see there, he's already matched his worst showing at Worlds, which is a semifinals appearance, but he's looking to go that much further, looking to make magic happen here on North American soil once again. But that brings in a bigger conversation around Worlds experience, right? Because you have the most experienced yep. player on the international stage in Faker, but you put him alongside a bunch of players that at least in relation to him, look like they're essentially first time. And look, look at that, 106 games on the world stage. Oh my Baker. God. <laughs> He's kind of carrying the majority of T1. More there, of than the rest of his team. Yeah, yeah. Gumayushi Kari, an owner there, were playing, of course, last year, Minch to the semifinals, and this is Zeus' first. And yeah, I was going to say, that's the big discrepancy for me, right? Is because you see it kind of matching up, then Faker in the middle, and Zeus with only nine games, but he's been such a standout at Worlds already. I've played more games than the four teammates that I have. I've also played more games than all of you on the other side of Come the stage, on. man. That is so wild. I mean, it is worth noting, though, that the rest of T1, if you pulled Faker out, still have more experience. Yeah. So True. that run that they had last year compared to JDG's run a couple of years ago, where they got bopped in uh, quarters by Suning, was a big disappointment for them. Yeah, I think some of the JDG players still very experienced. Of course, Kanavi and Yagao, you know, they're staple players. And 
it's not like having lo less world games is going to affect them too much because of their careers, of course. It's just this is as important as it gets. Well, we know a lot about Faker's story. Let's actually take a moment here to learn a little bit more about the youngsters by Faker's side in the new era of T1. T1 are about to compete for the organization's first finals appearance in five years and a shot at hoisting the Summoner's Cup for a record-breaking fourth time. And to make this historic run, veteran Faker is surrounded by players like Gumayushi, Owner and Zeus, some of the youngest and freshest faces to the T1 lineup, who also happen to be some of the best in the world at their role. So the question is, how did they get here? Let's start with Gumayushi, whose first real breakthrough came in 2018 in the Kespa Cup alongside a familiar face in the top lane. They took on Hanwha Life Esports, and despite doubts about a roster of amateurs, Guma and his team took down the LCK representatives 2-1, and Guma Yushi also took home the MVP. Despite falling short to Damwon in the next round, he'd caught the attention of those at the top, and found himself in the ranks of T1 just before the tournament had started. He remained as a sub for about two years, playing on the T1's challenger team and slotting into the main roster when he was called upon. The chipping comes in and Gumiyushi is in the front line for no reason, goes down, not able to stand up to the power... Despite the difficult loss in the 2020 regional finals to Gen G, Gumiyushi still believed in himself and approached T1 CEO Joe Marsh to confidently say that he was the best AD carry on T1. Apparently, Joe Marsh agreed, and in 2021, Gumiyushi began to split time as a starter with Teddy. His meteoric rise would come off the back of an incredible Worlds run with T1, reaching the semi-finals. With the lion's share of starting appearances and a superstar bot laner by his side in Keria, the duo were regarded as one of the best bot lanes in the world. It was an unbelievable year for such a young player. But there were still more rookie riches to add to the roster. Around the time that T1 failed to make Worlds in 2020, we got the first glimpse of Owner and Zeus on a YouTube series called League of Legends The Next. A series searching for the next superstars in the amateur scene where the top jungle were featured and mentored by veteran LCK players amongst the likes of Wolf, Prey, Marin, and Pawn. This, paired with a statement LCK Academy series win over Afrika the month afterwards, was all it took for Owner to be promoted to the main roster, splitting playtime with Kuz, while Zeus was slotted in as a substitute for Khan. But it's responded to really well, and look at the poke coming in as the kick is on BDD! Owner quickly surpassed his fellow jungler, and in less than one split he became the main starter for T1 making it all the way to the 2021 World Semi-Finals alongside Gumayushi. Zeus, however, was only able to play a few games during the spring season, but did have some standout performances which showed a lot of promise, as he then shadowed Kana for the rest of the year. And they're asleep! It's a double kill for the Lilia to go to the World Finals! And damn old legends and old legends! After the 2021 season, T1 dropped the idea of a 10-man roster, opting to move forward with Gumayushi and Owner as permanent starters. However, there was one question mark, the top lane, where T1 were considering whether a veteran top laner would suit the young roster better. Names among the likes of Nuguri were floating around as an option. But in the end, T1 ultimately kept their faith in their rookie, choosing Zeus as their starter for Season 12. Together, the three young players have fought back to the semi-finals alongside the greatest player of all time. Each one brings something distinct to the table. Owner brings discipline and aggression, something that T1 lacked over the last few years. Gumayushi brings confidence and drive to push himself to be the best and Zeus's raw determination has brought him here, to the cusp of being the best top laner in the world. The already incredible careers of these young players are small in the shadow of what lays ahead, but every impossible gauntlet is another opportunity for all of T1 to cement their legacies and push themselves to a world's final. So first of all, K-Girl, that was great. But second of all, uh, one thing that is really cool that you can track with this T1 team, especially comparing this world's appearance to last year's world's appearance, I think is Owner and how well he plays with this team. I think one of the big differences in their corner final was how he was able to play with his lanes really well. And I've really appreciated tracking him from when he joined his rise and T1's improvement through Worlds last year when people might have been a little shaky about them and then having a phenomenal year this year. And the X Factor is Zeus. And to give the T1 organization credit, they actually scouted him. He was a trainee since 15, I believe, with that organization. So they had invested him a long time, and he's finally looking like he's paying off on the world stage. Uh, a beautiful breakdown of the additions to that T1 roster. But now it's time for yet another Zoomer story the, in our first ever installment of Draw My LPL Life. Artwork and narration done by our own Emily Ray. Draw my LPL life, JDG369. 
369 was the top laner of King of Future, top esports' LDL team, and started for the top esports LPL team in late 2018 in the NEST and Demacia Cup tournaments. He quickly wowed audiences with his performances and his messy headphone hair, apparently. Fans translated his name 369 into dice rolls due to his volatility. A three would mean overextending and getting solo killed, while a nine would point to an outstanding carry performance. He rolls a three here, it's, it's very unlucky. After a promising rookie season in 2019, 369 became a staple top laner in the LPL during the 2020 season on a TES lineup that included Karsa, Knight, and Jackie Love that summer. He won his first LPL title. Going into 2020 Worlds, TES were a favorite, and while they didn't win, 369 garnered international acclaim. This team performed the first ever reverse sweep at Worlds and the only one until the recent DRX EDG series. 369 and Top Esports struggled in 2021 compared to expectations, failing to make the World Championship. 369 and his small champion pool, as well as his volatility, were blamed for a lot of problems on the team. In a now mimetic video, 369 was chewed out by Karsa for not being able to play Gnar or Gragas. However, this year, 369 has found a new home in JDG. He still has his volatile moments, but he's worked on all aspects of his gameplay, including when to group with his team, when to cross map, and making the most of champions like Fiora in side lanes. And also in picking up champions, he was accused of playing poorly like Gragas, which he has already played at this world championship. Above all else, 369 is someone who has persevered and additionally has even leaned into the memes and jokes about him, using them to fuel his improvement. That was incredible. That I was... gotta, I gotta be honest. I imagine laning against three six nine is a lot like being teammates with Emily. Um, what? Be better than easy, better than you, easy be mode. Better she than makes you easy in mode. Yes, yeah. it was incredible. <laughs> Emily Just, did all the drawings, oh all the narrations. Oh that was, Emily, what that was the fantastic. Heck? And such a great story as well. And I mean, what other better way to say it than you know? We've got two of the best top laners in the world in, in yeah. this tournament. That's really what it is. Both coming from different backgrounds, you know, with struggling things like with, uh, with um, 369 as he was on the rise in his rookie year still. There's a lot to talk about. So you already said it. We have the two best top laners here about to go head to head. But I want to know who everyone thinks is the actual best top laner in the world. So for those of you in chat, please go ahead and start spamming 369 Ooh. or Zeus. And we'll check back in with those results in a little bit to see where the fans stand. And while you vote, we turn our eyes to our featured matchup presented by Mercedes-Benz, where Zeus and 369 ready up for a battle that will define their regions. Today's featured matchup, sponsored by Mercedes-Benz, is the battle between the two best top laners in the world, Zeus and 369. This is the gauntlet. This is what you have to try and run through to prove that you deserve to be at the top of your game. So many players have failed to live up to the hype on the world stage, but Zeus has smashed all our expectations. The death ball of T1 retreats and Breeze will not find another kill. It is Zeus on the side. It was Zeus in the early game. Owner coming to back him up, and how could you have it any other way? Jungle and top of T1 again finding the fight and making it work. This is his first Worlds. This is a player that, in terms of how well he plays, is just insane. This top laner is becoming more and more lore accurate as we see him smite down some of the other gods that have come up against him. Gala on the backside immediately to stun now coming up. Gala, desperate to survive. He's getting ticked away. He's getting knocked down. The LT will not be enough way trying to have his hero moment, but T1 say not. Today. But the only way to defeat the king of the gods is to roll a nine. And the emperor is now the target. Three, six, nine finds the play and Rogue have lost two. JDG's superstar three, six, nine is the only top laner close to matching Zeus stats. He has struggled to make it to the world stage, but he is showing why so many name him as one of the best players in the tournament. Three, six, nine. Keep your eyes on him for the big engage. Cobb's going after Hope. Cobb thrown up into the air. Cobb is down. And JDG make it a double. 369 versus Zeus. That's the battle for the best top laner in the world. Only one of these superstars can advance to the final as the last bastion of hope for the LPL goes up against the most decorated team in world's history.
Now, of course, we already know it's a hype matchup, but Mark, I think we need to break down exactly why that is. So going back for how long people have been waiting for this matchup, in summer, when T1 was struggling a little bit, Zeus was clearly the biggest bright spot on the team. People identified him as the best top laner in the LCK, and it was a question of, is he the best in the world? And they were waiting for the contender to kind of emerge. That was clearly 369 by the end of playoffs, and then we wanted to see them at Worlds, but, you know, Group's draw didn't go that way. Quarter's draw didn't go that way. Ooh. And we're finally getting it in semifinals. And it reminds me so much of anime arcs. Whenever in popular <laughs> anime, they have tournament arcs. And you see these like oh historic matchups that are built up across the season. And you finally get the showdown at the end. And that's literally what this is. It's not always like the final battle of the season, but it's like one of the most important ones where you get to assert your dominance. And so there's an extra thing on the line here. Yeah, winning worlds is cool, but being hands down the best top player in the world is also very cool. I gotta love it. They love the I love you, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark. Mark slides onto an analyst desk. <laughs> bring an anime, anime, with, bring yeah. anime with him. Let's go. Everyone will be able to relate to one of those screenshots, you have to imagine. But there's the stats, of course. You can see the damage. They're first and second in the majority of these statistics, right? And we've seen flexibility from both. You know, when you think of the best player in a specific role, you think of many different things. Versatility when it comes to champion pool, how adaptable you are to certain game states. Can you play weak side, strong side? How much can your team play towards you and play against you? Uh, and I think both of these top players check all of those boxes. That's why it's so incredible to watch. I think we can see different versions of them. But speaking about T1, of course, they kept the same roster from last year and they had Kana uh, as the only uh, replacement coming in for Zeus. Now, when you watch their Worlds run, Kana was a very bad weak side player. The reason he wasn't as good as, uh, as Zeus and the reason he wasn't as flexible is because he really needed resources. So you'd often see owner lane gank top to try to get Kana ahead at level four or try to cover him as much as possible. There's games where, you know, they play a Lucian Jace matchup in the semifinals up against Damwon. Uh, Kana's ahead on Jace, but then he makes an incredible mistake around the dragon falls and then they just lose the dragon fight, right? So I feel like Owner's been in this hyperbolic time chamber of playing with a top laner that <laughs> oh, needed no. so many resources <laughs> that now, <laughs> no. after a year of practice, he's now re very well trained to have someone right. like Zeus yeah. in his team. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, when you think weak side top, they just think, oh, they kind of lose lane. It's like, no, it's actually so much more than that. Gracefully. And the fact, yeah, the graceful part is the thing that I think sometimes people have difficulty understanding. Um, but the fact that it does open up Owner to so much, and you see that improvement with how he's been able to communicate with all of his lanes throughout the year. All right, well, we've likened the matchup to many of your favorite anime battles, uh, but in this time, the fans have been voting in chat. Let's check in with them, see who they think is Ooh, going to, or see? is rather, Ooh. the best top oh, wow. laner yeah. in the world. And it's a 75% swing over to Zeus. I think a lot of people would favor him anyways, and then you throw the fandom angle behind it, and uh -huh. it's, it's Zeus every time. Also, man. again, you isolate to Worlds, right? He's just been popping off, uh, mm -hmm. I think, in, in, an, in another way. And so we'll see. We'll see if he can get it done against 369 today. Probably one of his biggest challengers. Uh, we've talked about the top laners plenty. I want to talk about some of the X factors behind them by handing it over to Emily for this edition of State Farm Neighborhood Tactics. Yeah, so I'm going to break down a really simple jungle path that Kanavi is going to do. We've seen a lot of these invades for Graves, so basically he's just going to come in here. He's then going to cut down after doing birds here, do his own raptors, and then cover his blue. So if we play it through, it's going to zoom in for me as well. Um, but when you take paths like this, the idea is that you're limiting the options of your opponent and you're getting, more importantly, Kanavi ahead on this power pick of Graves. Um, he's also able to pay attention to mid and sometimes reset Yagao's wave here as well. Um, but I think the big thing and the big difference between these two junglers is the power that Kanavi is, how intelligent he can be towards covering this. And actually, yeah, what you're going to see here is 369 does end up overextending a little bit. Kanavi comes to protect him a little late. Uh, however, they do get first blood and he trades. Um, I think this is the big thing, though, is that Kanavi is just so smart about where he goes. The team knows how to play around him getting himself ahead. He takes away so many options from his opponents, and he's such a massive carry threat that T1 is going to have to try to mitigate. Yeah, I completely agree. I think if JDG is favored in any part of the lanes or any part of the matchups in this semifinal, I think it has to be jungle, because Kanavi, to many people, that's why I think it was Doin B, lots of Reddit posts going on from pro players just saying if JDG didn't have Kanavi, God knows where they would be because he <laughs> is so damn good. He might be the best jungler at this tournament. Owner did something very similar on the Graves, you know, passing back through mid, but Kanavi is a carry jungler. He is a raw carry jungler, and I don't think you'll ever play tanks. No, I mean, if you look at some of the stats that 
four junglers who made to the quarterfinal stage in terms of DPM and kills. He is just head and shoulders <laughs> above anyone else. Canyon was kind of the only one in contention in terms of DPM. He's trying to keep pace. A full yeah. hundred over anyone else. And he has double the kills per game over owner at number two. And he is in a league of his own. And like you said, this is kind of the matchup more than any other. Obviously, top lane is really high, but this is the one that you need JDG to win and funnel mm -hmm. resources in and have him actually carry, as well as having a crazy champ pool. Yeah, you have to see what's open. You know, if JDG's on blue side and T1 don't take away something like Graves, like you have to fear for them, right? Because JD, uh, Kanabi's going to insta-lock that and try to power farm. The difference between him and Canyon is I think Canyon brings creativity, whereas Kanabi just brings raw firepower in the jungle, right? You pick him a carry, you know he'll get ahead. And it's about getting to those dragon fights with Kanabi ahead. When he has prior lanes, your gal can sacrifice and support his jungler. Yeah, and I think here you see the disparate uh, parts of their style, right? Like, this is going to be another matchup that could actually end up looking a lot like Canyon and Peanut in the Genji Damwon series, where you have two junglers and their teams play around them very, very yeah. differently. So it's going to be JDG's job to make sure that Kanavi is on something he's super comfortable on, where he can use his intelligence and his really strong pathing ability to get ahead and contribute later. Whereas Owner, I'm looking for him to be helping out his lanes a lot more. Uh, Kedro, you kind of dropped the phrase raw firepower. Is raw firepower enough? Well, I mean, it's like the idea of like, bra you know, brains versus brawn is yeah. kind of what it makes me think of. I, is that something that you can really do in this day and age in League of Legends is just run over your opponents? The game has definitely gone towards more of a team style. You know, it's very rare that you see players in competitive, especially to solo carry a game. But I think in the current meta with very skirmish heavy champions like Silas Akali mid, Aatrox has been a kind of Rubik's Cube of dissection of teams playing like Fiora and Jax into mm -hmm. it to certain levels of success. So you have all these skirmishes. The jungle will always find fights around Herald especially. And if you can get early key kills on that champ, uh, things like Graves and Viego, then I think they can run away with it. Just about three minutes to go to game time. It's time to know where you all stand when it comes to our first of two semifinals. We're starting with the fans, the MasterCard fan prediction, where they are giving it again well in favor yeah, of T1. I think it makes sense after surprising. seeing the Zeus fan predictions over 369. A similar spread here, 76 to 23 percent. Fan prediction rate so far this tournament, 72 percent. That's still that's still that's not bad. That's shooting pretty high right yeah. there. If I do say so myself, I would love that kind of a headshot percentage. The question where, is, where do you three? <laughs> question is, do you three agree with them? Uh, and so, as we return to the desk, I'm going to turn to Emily first. Oh, no. Uh, oh, do you don't want to go first? No, it's fine. We don't have to go. You, we can make them go first. Uh, oh, She's already there we go. It. There uh, it is. So, T131, or to 3 2 rather. Um, I think the big thing for all of the drama we've talked about, Faker and the Zoomers, we've talked about the top lane battle, we've talked about a potential jungle mismatch. Honestly, the thing that impressed me the most about T1 coming in from their quarterfinals match is how well they were actually cross-mapping and playing to side lanes. I was like, I know this team has phenomenal laners. I know this team has hands. That is never the problem in a T1 loss. So it's how are these players playing with each other as a team, and that is why I think T1 are going to win today. The uh, most important thing for me there is a 3-2 scoreline. Because that's games. all I want Let's from go. this point no onward is give us no. bangers. Kajol, you give me five games? I'm going 3-1 T1. Oh. I'm also in the same oh, oh, no. He's a non-believer. Look, I think JDG will take a game on blue side probably, but I feel like T1 will have figured out answers. So I think there's a few important champs in this series. Aatrox and Graves are the two that I think of. If T1 on red side can shut down JDG's picks, and shut down these first picks on blue, then I think they'll run away with the series. I'm not sure if JDG will have similar answers. <laughs> I like your answer. Mark's just a racing. No, no, no. I'm going JDG 3-2. I know that's not a popular opinion. And the thing about JDG, they make it hard for you to believe in them. Yes. More than anyone else of the best teams in the world, they fall behind in games. They drop a lot of games. It's, you know, the 10-game series that they played against TES regionally to, to win that bracket. Uh, I understand why people doubt them, but they have this ability, better than anyone else in the world, to never be out of a game. We've watched them win games from 3K down, 5K down, 10K down. And I feel like a lot of great teams win because they win from the moment the first the minions first meet. JDG can win from any point in the game and they're never out. I love that call out, right? Because if we go all the way back to the group stage, they play a number of teams that are no longer in the tournament anymore. Played them close. And yet, mm -hmm. JDG still came out on top. So there's there's yeah. some kind of magic there. And the, and the one thing we haven't really touched on much is bot lane, right? We touched on yeah. the, the yeah. Ash Heimendinger ride, right? But right. what will Hope and Missing come out with? Will we see Aphelios Lulu? Will we see Lucian Nami? And will we see weak side bots? Will we see more of a 4v4 skirmish heavy top side for these early heralds. 
while Lady Carry can rely, but get ahead in isolation to make it so those dragon fights are a little bit more swayed in their favor. That's another big question I have for the series and whether T1 will early rotate these crazy pushing bots to make sure they have to be prior to that first objective. Another great call, and I love the curiosities around bot lane. It was T1, right, that brought out a lot of interesting stuff when it came to the meta. Five seconds to go. Atlanta lift oh, kick off day one of the world's 2022 semifinals. JDG 같은 경우에 APL의 유일한 팀이기 때문에 저희가 훨씬 더 기대를 하고 있고 LCK와 LPL이 숙명의 라이벌인 건 맞습니다. 승부는 지금부터입니다. 세계 최고의 탑 라이너가 되기 위해 필요한 것은 무엇일까요? 지키지 않고 뚫는 버티지 않고 만들어내는 그런 압도하는 탑의 퍼포먼스 제가 존경하는 수많은 전설들이 T1을 거쳐갔습니다. 이제 제 차례입니다. 大家认为，如果你要想拿到冠军。 那你不能去挑选自己的对手，你要有信心战胜每一个对手。飞哥的话，第一次看比赛就是看他S3的决赛吧，然后现在九年过去了，没想到会跟他对位吧。想对T1说，你会在S3第一次被。한 포기하지 않고 노력한 저 자신에게 증명하고 싶습니다. 다시 한번 최정상에 설수 있다는 것. 여러분들이就是这一场是一眼目花色就会是一眼完美。 
competition, just four teams remain. They're players within touching distance of the Summoner's Cup. Our first semifinal match is a clash of terrifying talent. In one corner, the most successful team to ever grace the international stage, led by the greatest player of all time. And ready to challenge them, the last bastion of hope for the LPL. Atlanta, please join me in welcoming Korea's T1 and their opponents, champions of China, JDG Intelligence Sports Club! In the top lane for T1, with the highest damage per minute of any player in New York, it's Zeus! Across from him, an opponent to be feared, a man who's been here before, but this time looking to go further. Three, six, nine. Roaming the jungle, two players looking to build their legacies and bring home the Summoner's Cup for the orgs that gave them their shot. Filling the shoes of many greats before him, T1's owner! And the man who made his home in the LPL, now hunting for his first ever final, JDG's Kanavi! In the mid lane, it's the most decorated player in League of Legends history, the unkillable Demon King himself, T1's Faker! Opposite him, and looking to earn the title of Demon Slayer, it's you go! his critics with the fewest deaths of any player at Worlds 2022. T1's Guma Yushi! And for the LPL champions, making his semi-final debut in his first ever trip to Worlds, it's Hope! Your supports, making his third consecutive appearance at Worlds and gunning for his first ever taste in the finals. T1's Carrier! And for JDG, with the most assists of anyone in the group stage, call him the Assist King, it's missing!
For one team, a ticket to the final. For the other, a ticket home. Atlanta, give it up one more time for your semi-finalists, T1 and JDG Intel Esports Club! Promises to be an amazing, outstanding best of five. I am Freak here with Kobe and Vettius. How you two doing? Ooh, I can already tell that Atlanta is gonna blow the roof off this stadium. It is getting loud in here. We haven't even started. The energy is unbelievable, and we are so excited to get ahead of ourselves because. This game is going to be a banger. Both these teams 3 0 their way through the quarterfinals, and both of these teams look poised to bring us some excellent League of Legends. And I'm excited because the battle in top lane is the battle of, I would say, <laughs> the two best top laners in League of Legends. That is going to be a very fun battle. They're number one and two in every stat that matters. They dominate lane. Do they deal with the major team fights? Yes to both questions here. In the jungle, man, I, I, I mean, Kanavi is is truly outstanding. If you watch the pregame show, he's got like 100 more DPM than pretty much anyone else in the tournament in the jungle. He's got more kills per game than anyone else in the jungle in the tournament. He's going to blow the roof off. And on T1's side, their bot lane has been slamming. Yumi Yushi has been up and down, but at this tournament, it is all the way up. A true carry jungler, Kanavi, and that's going to turn our eyes towards this pick and ban phase. Because there is a tremendous amount of effort that's going to go into the counter picks. A slight difference here uh, for the junglers. You mentioned Kanavi with his huge DPM. That's because he plays so much Graves and Viego. He is not one to pick up this Sejuani, which has become so popular throughout uh, the tournament here. And so T1 immediately banning that there. I love that ban against JDG because uh, they have used it a lot on 369 for these setups. I think that JDG have to be cautious of some of the really powerful picks that still exist in the meta. And also the answers to them. Remember, Yumi consistently taken off the board if you're red side. Aatrox, another big band that you have to remove. But then what do you do about the Graves? With the Caitlyn already removed, you can't get rid of all three. So you have to be willing to give something up. And already attention here paid to the mid lane for Faker. He has had a huge preference for the Akali in the triumvirate of the mid lane champion pool. <laughs> and so they ban away the Silas from Yagao. The power pick. Yagao has used Silas in six of the last seven games. Really good blue side target bans here from T1. The Aatrox bans suggest to me that T1 want JDG to ban away the Graves, which then suggests that they have something else that they want to prioritize. We're yet to see an Azir oh, game, but they're going to prioritize Nami. the Lucian Nami bot side of the map. So you, ha you have to expect that. The question, because these bottom lanes, the, the flexibility of Gumi, Yushi, and Karia has been their greatest strength. Have the LPL teams, have JDG actually been able to practice the other answers here? Ophelios into Lushanami with Lulu by his side has been the preference thus far. It certainly has. This is the common answer that JDG used into Rogue's bot lane. It was always the bot lane of Rogue that was drafting this Lucian army, and every single time, JDG's bot was able to get the push, even with the Aphelios Lulu. The question is, do they need to lock in the Lulu now? There is room for them to lock in an early jungle if they want to, and given that yep. Diego is such a contested jungle, it makes sense that Kanavi would want to get his hands on it. Exactly. No change here. As we said, Graves, Viego, the Kanavi champions, they want to keep him on a damage dealing reset sort of champion here. So that means we'll probably be seeing 369 on a bruiser or tank towards that top side of the match. I wouldn't be surprised to see something like an Azir here for T1 as well. They could also answer with the jungle themselves. Of course, Ona does have a very deep and flexible champion pool. His two most played have been removed so far, well, three arguably. Only the least in is what we've seen, but he's going to lock in the vice. Yep. So we will see that answer from him. A lot of lockdown for Ona, a lot of gank potential in the early game. Oh. T1 with a cheeky hover. It wouldn't be a surprise, but we're expecting the Lucian. Yep. This, this flexibility that I'm talking about for Guma Yushi and Karia, these two players have played eight different champions in their nine games. They've only repeated once. Now it's going to be a second repeat, though, here with the Lucian being locked in. A little bit of a tantalizing hover there. Yep. But as expected, we fill out these bottom lanes with their preferred partners. A lot of these bottom lane matchups come down to those preferred supports with the AD carries. It's always 
these two matchups. And the style we're seeing here in Champ Select is, is backed up by how these teams have played so far at Worlds. Gumayushi has died on exactly two champions in exactly two games, and he and Karia have been lane dominant trying to do it here against JDG. And now you gotta look towards the mid lane for the Vans here, because Faker has had this big preference for Akali, and with the Silas already taken down, expect them to whittle down on his champion pool. They take away that victor, the longer range, scaling mid lane there with the laser farming. And, and since they expect a tank from the top side from D69, as we yeah. said, with Kanavi on his damage jungler, they ban away the Orn, one of the best ones that 369 has utilized here. I would say if they're also still trying to follow that up with more tank bans, you would think the Gragas, but Renekton has been the preference for 369. 369 has the most solo kills of anyone at the tournament. A lot of them come on that Renekton. Seven solo bolos for himself, and there's the Akali follow-up as we expect, targeting Faker. Yeah, champions I'm expecting here include Gragas for the top lane, and on the mid side, Ari and Tali. If you look back at what they played domestically in the LPL to win the trophy, JDG in the playoffs, huge step up from Hope and Missing. They outperformed their KDAs, their KP. They were huge in the team fights that won them the final. And as far as 369, you can see from the Orin band, they think tanks are going up there. My eyes go to Gragas, but yeah, as you called it, Kobe, Renekton is the band. Okay, so it looks like nothing too crazy coming out. Both sides kind of taking away some of the strengths. <laughs> the cheeky hover there of the Heimerdinger <laughs> from JDG. But I think what they do need is some form yeah. of engage. But they can save that for a little bit later. Of course, both Azia and Talia, two very comfortable champions for Yagao, give him a lot of freedom to get that push in the mid lane and roam to better enable Kanavi. When we look at JDG, this is a mid jungle duo that works together to get Kanavi ahead and having push and roam in mid, it's very typical and strong for JDG. And specifically what JDG have done here is try and funnel Faker onto the Azir. The Talia here has been Yagao's consistent counter pick into the Azir pickups. With the bans on Victor and Akali, JDJ are trying to force Faker and into this pick here for the Azir, pull it out, because Faker has not played it here at Worlds yet and has focused so much more, um, you know, but, towards those, those yep. kill threats. This is what he's playing domestically. Azir was his most played, but Lissandra and Galio oh what he went for next. We get a carry in the top side. Zeus blinds Camille with a Galio flying over the top, and 3-6-9 in game one gets counterpick. And if you remember your world's history, Faker on some of his biggest carry performances, carrying all three lanes on Galio, and the quintessential duo solo lane pick here of Galio plus Camille. The easiest possible execution of a kill backline carry. Camille ultimate into Galio ultimate. You can consistently get these engaged. Plus, you can consistently also go on top of the Vi. They have so many answers, so many setup possibilities here for T1 to get Baker an ideal Galio ultimate. So when we go back to the quarterfinals, T1, they played a lot through their top side of the map. They have options to play through top, but largely with Faker looking to get those roams off around level six, looking to set up for those top lane dives, those bot lane dives with the stacked waves. JDG needs to commit a little bit more to that top side, try and get 369 ahead in this counter pick matchup. They can leave their bot side to scale, ramp up into the later, the later game and be that team fight threat but JDG need to find a way to shut Zayas down, and not many teams around the world have successfully been able to do it. Yeah, I, I really think JDG has to snowball, and Kanavi has to get early kills. Otherwise, this T1 draft is so good at picking off side laners. So since JDG are looking to play these side lanes, you've got Camille, Vi, and Galio. That is set up to assassinate anyone pushing on these side lanes. Amazing blue side draft here for T1 getting into our first game of yeah. the semifinals. And Camille Jax is our top lane matchup. Zeus and 369, the two best top laners in the world. And they gave the man from JDG counterpick. He brings out the Jax, and we'll see if he can outperform Zeus. An absolute stellar performer. T1, four of these five players were found, scouted by T1 themselves. The only transfer is Karia, picked up after his own rookie year. T1 with a self-found lineup, ready to see if they can make the, the World Finals again. Yeah. Ooh, oh, it's, sweep it. It's been a lot of talk of building up younger rookie talent. And T1 are setting an example for the entire world with how successful they have been. Zayas, Owner, Umiyushi all being brought up through their youth program, trained themselves internally.
So a minor point I want to bring up there, you saw them dance around and wait to kill the ward. Hope tried to walk out of range, not get XP. He still got XP. Every one of the five has some XP from that ward, which means no one is getting level two from the first wave. They attempted to let 369 and Yagao get level two off six minions. That was not successful. They ran out of time. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to be keeping our eyes on jungle pathing now. Kanavi going to start on the bot side with a solo start, it looks like, and he's going to path up towards top. This is expected, looking to mainly cover for 369 in the early push, making sure that he is comfortable and safe. We talk so much in draft <clears throat> around this top side and making sure that 369 is comfortable and safe in the one versus one, making sure that this counter pick works out for JDG. Yeah, there's a lot of volatile lanes to look at. And if you go back and watch a lot of the LPL games for JDG this year, you really do focus on Kanavi. I actually love his jungle playstyle. Um, it's one of these ones that is cut, kind of a pay it forward jungle playstyle. My personal favorite, actually, where you go and oftentimes he'll visit Yagao's lane, push out the wave for him, ward for him, so that he can then pay it forward, have Yagao then come support him in jungle invades or in going and ganking on the side lanes. It's one of the reasons that Kanavi has been one of the best quintessential carry jungle players with the highest gold per minute of any jungler here at World and the highest level two each, Gumiyushi. Not gonna be whimsied here. Looks like Shield was learned by missing as these damage comes across, trading back and forth. And right now, DDG have the health, be a good sidestep in the Calibrum snipe. And look at this jungle path here from Kanavi immediately looking to play off some of these volatile lanes, going mid just as we expect with Yigao. Here we go, Faker has Ghost, has Flems, or has Flash, I should say, finds the taunt. Will they find the stun? Sidesteps it. Faker walking away, has burned his Ghost, though, down one summoner in mid. So, a bit of trade of summoner spells all across the map. The heal being burned down in bot, the Ghost being spent there by Faker. The fact that he was able to get that early push against the Talia, you would expect that Yagao kind of let him get that early push except for that play, and Kanavi is quick to take advantage of it. As Kobe was setting up, this is a very common trend that we'll see from Kanavi playing through mids to try and burn those summoners to make it easier for Yagao to get that push so that he can then look to roam. And again, we'll keep our eyes on the top side of the map and these level sixes for both these mid laners. Exactly. It's such an effective style as a jungler because there's no better feeling than having a mid laner be able to come gank with you or gank for you even and be able to soak up those extra minions. Meanwhile, Owner over towards the bottom side. They're really trying to play off their first oh. pick, Lucian Nami duo lane here. Heal is down. They don't have obvious easy escapes. Their CC lands, it'll stick through, but not going to find the dive here. Scars lose boss underneath the bottom side. Wave is gone. The camps are out, and it's going to be both junglers getting a pretty easy scuttle. And the cost of that for jungling and revealing yourself uh, and blowing that Skyrim's Bloom is always the counter jungling possibilities. Look at already this CS lead that Kanavi has jumped out to here on the Viego. And Vedius, you were talking about this top lane matchup. Whenever your jungler is able to invade enemy blue it's quadrant playable. like that versus blue Oh team, yeah, yeah, the war just in time. It's super, it's very, very beneficial for just your lane because of this ward that you get to leave behind. It gives you so much information to play off of, and 369 can be as aggressive as he wants. And Isaiah, with his wave in a bit of an awkward spot right now, has to be a little bit more cautious. But I think what we saw was a great contrast of the jungle styles. Ona, very much more about trying to enable his very talented laners. Not to say that he's like constantly, repeatedly ganking every single lane, but he really does try to set up his laners for oh. success. Really good trade here for Zayas. Out of mana though, can't chase for any more than that one. 369 safe at 200 HP. Will of course reach in a bit back up with that Doran shield, but Zayas now back in control of the lane. 369 though, with the wave pushing into him, he can look to go back to base. He doesn't have to expend the TP if he doesn't want to. Missing in a bit of trouble. A lot of damage, but he does get the Whimsy, I'm gonna give you some of the damage. Flash forward, cleanse at the root. Damage out of hope, and it's gonna be flash for cleanse. Cool that advantage to T1. Interesting, that's gonna attract a lot of attention with no flash available on Ooh, home. You see the immediate response from both mid laners as well as both junglers here. There is blood in the water already. Ooh. Of course, knows where owner is. No snakers down there, but not yet level six. JDG, everyone's a wave away from six here. Both the Galio and Talia can make their way down. Similar ranges on the ultimates. This wave crashing right now is the one, or the one speeding in a second, is the one that gets level six. We'll see him come down pretty soon, possibly. Look for someone in the brush. No one's down there. T1's safe to kill the control ward. The thing about Lucian Army is it is inherently a very volatile lane. You want to be finding advantages in the straight-up 2v2 because of your additional sustain and because of the amount of damage that you have, which means that T1 are investing a lot into making sure that Karia and Kumayushi can build up these leads. Faker is hovering to the bot side of the map. Owner is consistently looking for opportunities, and while he is falling behind in the isolated jungle 1v1 matchup, he's making sure that this bot lane is building a lead. 
Yeah, you can see the first battle that will be fought over the war that is bottom lane is this area here. This river is going to be the highway of ganks between mid and bottom that is going to be constantly under attention here from both sides. I want to take a minute to talk about the T1 bottom lane as they should be able to escape here because the T1 bottom lane, their performance at World has been magnificent. Oh. And one of the biggest improvements from T1's summer split for themselves Gumayushi and Karia have the top two KDAs of all players, not just bottom layer players at Worlds thus far. 18 and a half KDA for Gumayushi. And it gives them the confidence to early pick that duo. Meanwhile though, JDG will be able to use Kanabi, start up this dragon. I mean, Gumayushi has only died in two of their nine games. It's crazy. And that was the total time so yeah, far. That was the third game against RNG, and then that was the game that they lost against Fnatic. Aside from that, he has been deathless. The man has had an incredible tournament, and right now he's being set up for success. But JDG, as you rightly said, were able to find that small advantage. Kanavi is playing the map very well. He hasn't been able to find any successful ganks yet, but this is his style. He leverages the pressure that his waves are able to generate, information on where the enemy jungler is, to build up leads for himself, and steal away these objectives. So JDG, while very even in the gold, ahead now on Drang. And he's scaling away here on this Viego. To be able to move towards that Divine Slender he so want to build down there as the bot lane also is holding up. The fact that Ophelios is within five CS of Lucian, definitely pretty solid, especially when Guma got such a very good first recall. Managed to force a 1,000 gold recall for both. Got uh, Serrated Dirk into just like components very, very good, and yet not pushing the lead much more beyond that. And now I want to refocus back on Kanavi, kind of the heart of JDG here, this carry jungle player, because with the CS lead, uh, Viego, once you get level six, is a huge force in Rift Herald fights. We're about to tick towards that eight minute mark uh, once the Rift Herald does spawn. Uh, because you have that reset playability here for them, I want to see if JDG oh. can get themselves an advantage. Owner, meanwhile, is bottom lane, still level five on the Vi. The control ward on the river, he's going to be spotted right about now. Missing, has to flash, maybe. It's going to be the first one missing heal for Moose Speed. Flash it himself. Double, not at all, giving enough damage. He's going to be there. The Polymark, first blood for Gumayoshi. He won the second for Trump. Now missing finds a kill. Lose this life. Wow, incredible play there from T1 as they're able to commit and get some kills in the bot side of the map. Hope with some beautiful sidestepping was not enough. So much was committed from the T1 side to secure those kills. And while they will draw first blood, JDG walk away with the Herald. It's honestly such a smart read from T1. They expect the same play I was just talking about on that Rift Herald for Kanavi. And so Owner takes that opportunity to make the bottom side play. Ward there for T1 on the top side with Kanavi successfully being able to get that Rift Trail to now turn his eyes towards the top side. Galio has the ult. Pretty good damage. They're going to put the ulti on indeed. But which way can he go as Galio arrives? But it is a three versus two. The taunt is short. The damage got towards Kanavi. Barely stays alive. Finds the damage, but no. The re-engage is in. T1 find their third kill. And Order wants a little bit more. Faker dives in. Shots in time. Again, JDG get a single kill back. Meanwhile, 2v1 dive possibility. No way. Outside. He's going to whimsy. He's going to find the slow. The root will be there. Whimsy. He's going to drop back row. The shot lands. And Guyuchi makes him pay for the row. And it's blow for blow across the map. We're almost tied in gold here with the extra dragon going over to JDG. And now being able to push out on bottom side. Karia finally getting back. But we first see that Galio ultimate use to try and cross map defend towards Zeus for T1. They overstep a little bit with the extra tower diamond, uh, damage there and giving over the extra kill. But look at the minimap. T1 read the play very well. They're already making their way up towards the top side well before this play is even happening, which means the fake is in range to land the ultimate. The damage from the Galio is incredible as he's able to force Kanavi out of the fight. And then the second that 369 overextends, he's not expecting both the Vi and the Nami to be here, which means that they overextend and T1 are able to find two kills. It's just so smart there. Owner. Knowing, again, that JDG are going to play a top side uh, after the bottom side showing, is able to get up there and use his Violta. Meanwhile, Gumayushi left on the bottom side, 2v1. There is no outplaying this. Good job from Missing to tank the tower aggro. Moves in, gets a knockup with his ultimate before then getting out of tower range. 
And Hope able to snipe him with the ultimate. Just really good awareness from the JDG bot lane, ultimately making that trade a two for two. It was the best thing they could have done, and I'm glad that they were able to commit to it because they keep this game still very even. Both these teams are bloody teams, and we're already seeing it here in game one of this semifinal. And we're seeing JDG just edge out a little bit in the objective control with the Dragon as well as the Rift Hail still in pocket for Kanavi to be able to use. But Gumayushi and Faker both getting rich off those plays. The only one with any turret plates killed so far is top lane there. 369, I feel like, would probably want the extra gold ahead of his opponent. None of them are close to dying at this point in time. T1 actually leads the world championship in turret difference <laughs> across the early game, holding like it here so far as well with pressure in a lot of these lanes. Yeah, they, they lead the ch world championship in a lot of ways. Explosive wins, as we've seen from them. Very, very quick Ooh. game times as well. See about some top side focus again, though, from Kanavi. Worth noting, expect. first mythic in for Hope. The wave state is in a very awkward position for Zayas, and he knows exactly where his team is, which means that there's a real risk of Kanavi being here in the top lane. Zayas doesn't have the flash, does still have the E at his disposal, though, so he's playing as cautiously and as carefully as he can. Keep your eye on your Gao on the minimap as well, as he is hovering around the top side of the map. GDG is threatening this. Ooh, actually interrupts the E back. Will not find the stun, nor the damage from Kanavi. He's going to summon the Herald and go for a couple of plates taken. They may auto-attack one down, but turret likely won't die, but uh, with Talia on the way over, they can probably just force this whole thing down. Yeah, it's a, it's a known trade here. JDG trying to force on topside with Rift Hill at activation, giving up that dragon. Look at Faker coming over for the Galio ult. Oh, double combo, it's gonna catch Kanavi, it makes so much damage. Ults out of safety, finds a stun. Oh, Choke it away from Faker, and because mid is here, it's a 3v2, and JDG find the kill. JDG with the outplay, it felt to me like Faker read the play once more. He was prepared to cover Zayas, but JDG were confident in making the play happen. Three versus two, they're able to get the outplay, and they walk away with the kill and the plates. Yeah, it's T1 trying to make the same counterplay this time around, but can't quite get the outplay in the two versus three this time. JDG get that extra kill, and they did need that because of the heavy investment up there, because Dragon traded over to T1, splitting those now. Gold lead still not that significant. A lot of these, you know, item timers are being matched by both teams, hitting all their first mythics on the exact same time. So it's going to be about that next engage, the next big Galio ultimate from Faker. Now, after you see these recalls and the support recall timers moving in, trying to set up the wards to do so. 700 gold lead, as you mentioned, item timings there is a, well, it's, I mean, it's still four things apiece, right? You got the mandate for carry, you've got the crown here for your gal. Looking for their second drink, not quite the sidestep there, but support combat not gonna be that lethal just yet, but you've got a jungler coming across, forcing the flash away from missing without tidal wave. We'll see if the team fight looks good. Chad Nami here, carry a forces support flash all by himself, has the backup of the rest of the T1 team, so. Missing knows he's got to get out of there. I was a little surprised that Missing chose not to invest his ultimate, but the second he saw Ona on that control ward, he was like, I could get ulted here. This is not worth it. So he chooses to flash out. Big wave here that JDG want to make sure they can grab. So Kanavi is just here to cover. Something that we consistently see from him, making sure that his lane is as safe as possible as JDG enter the mid game in an even state. You can see that JDG have been able to accrue a large number of plates across the map, and they've been able to successfully gain advantages in both top and even in mid, just because of how Yagao and recent plays was able to get the better of Faker. And some very important wards actually just see Faker there attempting a hover towards the top side of the map for JDG. Meanwhile, JDG clearing out all of these wards through that mid-bottom highway of the river to make a power play for themselves on the other side of the map. Not gonna find the ward kill themselves. The T1 kills out the aggressive control ward. Bot lane will be pushed in, but not much else to play for. No neutral objectives are up. Actually, Harold has respawned, so that is going to be an available play. You can see Kanavi walking to that side of the map. So this is the main plan here from JDG. Kanavi hovers the bot, makes sure they can catch the wave. Then he makes sure that they can push the wave out, which gives them first roam up to mid. Now you can see them catching the mid wave, and now they're threatening Sword's to die. die. Yeah, this is going to be a 2v1. Not much you can do. Ulti's a dodge wave, a knockback. But will it even matter? Looks for the jump away. Doesn't get too far. And Kanavi's going to find himself the kill. JDG put more resources top lane at 369.
is rewarded. Just exquisite macro there from JDG. The play from bot into mid with the mid throw into top into the successful tower dive. He went for T1 me, now contests 4v5. I'm a good spot. Q smite claimed by owner. But the team fight is what matters because hope is here. Gale forces in, jumps in for the root, ults for a bit more damage, but no kills be found just yet. Now this slow. Q oh. put not quite there. Flashed in for a stun. The knock of the kill. Kanavi goes down. Fall all the same. One for one mid lane controlled by JDG. Zayus is alive, so Faker could recall, heal on Galio, try and walk out to the map to be able to ultimate and look for a counter play, but it looks like JDG won't give them the opportunity. They back off, push out mid lane afterwards. What a what a steal there, being able to smite away the Rift Herald and deny that objective to JDG after their successful pickoff on Zeus. And this is the thing you can never underestimate with T1, the individual talent. The sidestep there oh. from Kamiyushi, the steal from Ona, the taunt from Faker. Four versus four initially because of the back from 369 means that T1 see a window to force this fight. But then their goal is the second that 369 rejoins, they need to disengage. But look at the ultimate here from Ona. The second that the commitment comes in, he gets knocked right up by front. Faker, knocked up by Ona and they're able to one-shot the jungler from JDG. It, it does end up being a trade as Hope is able to find a kill, but the Herald is yep. denied from T1, along with the Herald being denied from JDG. Yeah, nice little seismic shove from Yegao to make sure it is indeed a one-for-one one in the end. And a bunch of these kills over, going to Hope. Flashing forward early, very, very aggressive Aphelios play here from Hope. Want to see if JDG can keep up this pace? Because as the side turrets go down, that's when these two comps get really exciting. It's all about picking off those side laners, who can be first of the play, and then trying to avoid, or in T1's case, set up that big Gallia ultimate to make sure it happens. One of the things that impressed me the most in the quarterfinals was JDG's ability to set up around objectives. And what I mean by that is the way in which they set up the lanes across the map, the way in which they control they the, the space. Up. And again, we're seeing it. Look at how Yagao was able to get the push in bot. They sacrificed the wave in mid to contest this objective, and now they're looking to force it. Or is the TP out of the top side? Ulti on. Is it going to be enough to kill off? Missing, though, has to walk away. He's got the reinforcements coming around there. No knockouts for the Galio. But it's out of the back side. Really can't live for long. Zeus forced to jump away. And 369 gets another one. Cannot going to be safe in the back line. Cannot find the stun for 369. A one for nothing. T1 chose to hop away from the top turret. They wanted to fight for the Drake, but JDG win that fight. What play from 369. He flashes out of the Galio ultimate just onto the edge there, and they re-engage after Zeus taking down this top laner, being rewarded with the dragon, number two to their names. JDG outplaying again in this team fight. Really well played team fight by JDG, but 369 now isolated. Gonna be a lot of danger on him. One versus three has the dodge up. Can he find a kill? Goes for Caria. The squishiest member forces the flash away. Somehow Caria snipes the kill himself. The flash into the control warded bush was so smart there from Caria to completely deny vision from 369 in the event that his Q was off cooldown. Kanavi, though, once again, stealing away to oh. oh, I stand corrected. Zayas, he's just gonna walk away with that one. Cheeky steal from him. No smite from Kanavi. No way. He's able to steal it away from Kanavi there didn't have smite as it was still coming down but that was such a bold play there able to escape with his life as well oh attempt here oh, this Very personal wise. now Kanavi is looking to say yes <laughs> you stole my red buff now I'm looking for your life but it looks like they have no wave to really threaten to dive here Yigao does not want to risk it and look at this on the top side it must be noted Faker getting this side lane turret again once these turrets go down it's gonna get so exciting already this game one is delivering the gold so close right now, coming down to these small spacings. You mentioned Avedius, the all-in engage here onto, onto missing. They have the Camille ult plus the Galio ultimate, but 369 flashes away from the Galio ultimate, and then nobody wants to go over this Yagao field of rocks on the bottom side, which allows JDG to focus fire and take down the Camille getting them the extra person advantage and the objective. It's important to realize that T1's comp is inherently a dive comp. People all want to be collapsing in on a single target, but they chose to dive onto missing in a choke point, which for champions like Talia, for Lulu, these are great spaces where they can punish their opposition. The ultimate from Hope would just be a bit of damage, but T1, they overcommitted into that funnel, and then they quickly regretted their decision. Exactly, and that means the important flashes you're looking to burn for the fights oh. are gonna be... 4v2, there's the Stun, pretty good damage on Isaiah. Does he live is the question. You got puts down the minefield. Yes. And Faker says hello. 
and wants to say goodbye. The wave comes across just what Faker wanted to do. A stopwatch buys two and a half seconds, but it's still gonna be 400 gold to buy items. Going to JDG, a two for zero team fight. JDG finds the secret agent there in the brush. They assassinate Zeus, and now they're gonna run the map. They have their eyes on the Baron. The pings are coming down, but they've decided to commit to mid. Now they're looking for another kill. Gumiuchi trying to run for his life, gets out. I don't see a three. I see six, nine on the scoreboard right now. JDG winning with a lot of characters in the top lane. Kanavi got a bunch of kills and solidly ahead now in game one. JDG are just playing the map and they're playing the fight so well. T1 are looking for these picks, but they're inherently overgrouping at this point in the game and JDG are just outplaying them in the straight up 5v5. Yeah, really good spacing from these JDG members. Getting outside of these skill shots, re-engaging and taking down immediately Zayas in back-to-back -back scenarios here. Huge pickup for them. It just clicked to me, your clever 6-9 score. Yeah. is so clever for Thank you, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's have a look back at this clip. So this is on award. Uh, T1, double, <laughs> double member invade, and JDG go right for them. You've activated our trap card. Once Faker comes late in on the Galio as well, it's just another delivery of an extra kill. When T1 go for these attempted secret plays, you need to have a sweeper ready to make sure you are not on vision. Yeah, you because can... JDG, they do not hesitate. Exactly. They have been such a good job coordinating these engages. You can see that T1's idea there was to inherently threaten the tower. They wanted to try and, oh, if you don't back off, we're yeah. going to dive you. But JDG was primed and ready as you be very clearly highlighted. So we're now looking at the next Drake spawning in about a minute and 20 seconds. JDG would love to get their hands on that. So Yugao already pathing up towards top, started the slow push off. We'll start making his way down towards the mid lane as well. JDG still have a lot of time, but the same could be said for T1. As Gumiyushi throws down a bit of damage down onto Hope. He will have the red gun to be able to life steal that back up, but it's JDG with primary control over the river right now. Top lane fight yet again, equal levels for now, but items two completed for 369. Zeus able to jump away, heal back up with the back flip and grasp. Jungler on his side now as well. Could be a 2v1 onto the top laner. Has to be respectful in a little bit. The mid wave, though, is given to JDG. Now, I expect uh, T1 to go for some pickoff plays. We mentioned in Champ Select, the ability to pick champions off is the greatest strength of their setup. The Camille, the Vi, the Galio, looking to attack those side lanes. But JDG have just been so much better at defending it. Yigao constantly being there early on the move. Kanavi constantly hovering 369 in his pushes, yep. and they're able to get another tower here. And huge control ward spotted four people running out of T1's lower jungle up towards mid. They are going to push for this turret. It might be a one for one turret play ultimately. Gumi has to drop aggro because he went for W poke, and that means the turret will live. They couldn't have spent the money anyway, but it would have meant a little bit of map control. Fourth Drake of the game. JDG up two to one on that mark so far. Cloud Drake spawns in three. Gotta watch Hope. Everybody is looking for the engage on Hope. There's no flash on him. He's in the middle of the mid lane here. Very vulnerable on that Aphelios. Should be the big target. Yeah. Red gun, Bloodthirster, there flash on in. Looking for the time. Everyone presses R, and he's shut down. Can JDG win 4v5 is the question. They own the river, they do not own mid lane. Turret will fall. Knockback is there, Faker Zonias. Gonna stay alive with the disengage flash. Looks at the cleanse flash <laughs> away from Yagao. Looks for it again. Oh, taunt 369. No, bump of the way. Flash back to safe. The owner can't catch him either. 4v5. JDG are fighting. A taunt will land from Faker, but 369 can fight back. Finds his stun. Oh, knocked up into a bubble. And Faker just barely lives. But JDG don't have an AD carry, and they win the fight 4v5. Well, they run them off the objective. They can definitely turn back for the dragon, and that is going to be Dragon Soul Point. This would put them at number three, putting so much threat on T1. Big pickoff. T1, great shot calling. As we mentioned, that's the target you're looking for. You set it up perfectly, Kobe. You talked about how they were looking for that single target, and this is the idea of the comp. Wow, Flash in from Ona. The chain CC is beautiful. There's nothing the Hope can do to escape. But the way in which JDG leveraged the space to just chip away at T1, make it difficult for T1 to re-engage again. They got a good pick down onto Faker. Faker's flash is clean, but the response is just as clean from Yagao. And at this point, they're just running away because they have no real way to start the fight off once again. And then, oh my god, these re-engages are so fun to watch. 369 has to flash out immediately. He knows he can chase Faker because the Zonia's is down for Faker. And over the Cloud Soul move speed buff, they're able to close the distance here, chase T1 out of range of the objective. So even though JDG lose their AD carry, they lose priority. 
they're still able, with the health chunks on T1, able to get that objective. This is the world-class performance we were looking for in the semi-final of 2022 Worlds, and we're getting it. The gold is still dead even. JDG do lead in Dragons, but you know that this game could still go either way. A single good fight for either side could swing the game dramatically. Baron's still up. Dragon in the next four minutes for that soul point. We'll see if JDG can retain control. It is three to two in turrets right now. Still close in kills and with only 400 gold separating these two squads right now. JDG still seems to be holding all the cards. Double Black Cleaver actually on their front line. Looking for more damage focus, honestly, that build. Obviously, you can go tanky with like a Death Dance something, but they have chosen to do as much damage as possible. Frozen Heart now on the way for 369. Says Faker's not a damage threat, everyone else is. I'm so excited to watch now the mid game side lane play because both these teams are so good at pushing and still having the global to come cover. Right now, you'll see a big movement towards pushing in to get vision around Baron. There's enough damage in the game that if you commit too far without any vision on the other side, you will give up such a big, big objective here. And JDG know that T1 just overcame RNG, one of the biggest mistakes RNG made in that game, were giving up vision around Baron, giving up that that Baron to T1. JDG is so relentless with their vision control, though. You can already see on the map how much they've invested into this topside river, making sure that they have control over this objective. And the main goal of this is to force T1 to have to spend their vision to just clear out an area of the map to give T1 a little bit of extra security. But now look, they come back onto that two control wards already picked up Kanavi, another two control wards are missing. They're ready to push this vision deeper and deeper, and they're setting up for these future objectives, making sure they can control and limit what T1 can do on the map. We are several thousand gold away from Hope finishing Infinity Edge to get his third item of the board. About 1,200, 300 gold in inventory right now. So still needs to do once IE, pickaxe plus the combined. So 1,500 or so gold to go. LDR be, of course, a much cheaper road is possible as well if he wants to punch down the front line. With double cleaver, I don't expect LDR to be optimal, but we'll see which way he goes if he wants a sooner power spike because that Cloud Soul is up in two and a half and you only earn about 400 gold a minute for play. We'll see which way he goes with this one. JDG still aggressively pushing in the bottom side. A high ability haste build, as we've seen. And looking right at that bot tier two with Zeus maybe recalling in his face. Yeah, it's very interesting when you allocate Galio all the way to a top side here like Baker, because when T1 show a Galio up there, you do have a global quote unquote ultimate, but it's not the entire map like a teleport. It's continental. Exactly. <laughs> he's, he's running double uh, you know, mobility summoner spells have a greater impact once he gets into the fight. But you know JDG are paying attention. Lane allocation for T1, so incredibly important here with Faker. Uh, Zeus is the only one that has actually the full range of motion there. You can see how rich Gumiyushi is. Freak, you were talking about the itemization earlier on. And I'm looking at how much gold he's sitting on. He is a very strong AD carry. He's uh -oh. looking for missing. Missing jump. Okama comes across. How much time can they buy? 369 for now. Tied away, Volti. And it's a two for nothing. Zeus finds a double. And just like that, T1 pounce. A very quick pick turns into two kills. And T1 are ruthless in finding and shutting JDG down. There's no way JDG are going to be able to win a 3v5, right? No way they can make a hero play on Baron. Let's see if they try three members of JDG versus the full might of T1. Four whole wards on the support, but he's dead right now. Can't help the ward into the pit. Health runs at about half HP. Smite is up on both sides. Faker dives in, and the rest of the squad comes by. Economy splashes away, burning down with the red. Wants the kill. He can't get it as hope fires over the wall. Get it. JDG don't need a 4v5. They barely even need three. <laughs> JDG, 3v5. T1 don't want to flip the Baron, guys, so they go over the back of the wall trying to kill Kanavi. But JDG kite them through their red buff and get the counter kill onto Owner. What a stand. JDG, hold fast here against the odds. So, oh wow. So T1 see missing, walking into the fog of war off the minion wave, and they're quick to find the pick. 369 very quickly follows as T1 ruthlessly run down JDG and catch them unawares. But the second that T1 head towards the Baron, you think, as you said, Kobe, surely there's no way. The <laughs> turning point was that T1 committed to the fight. They turn, they don't actually flip the Baron. Their eyes are set on killing Kanavi. Yeah, they're looking for the turn here. Faker on the side with Galio. He's got flash, so he wants to get this big comp flash on the enemy jungler. He does instead get hope and then the knockup 
onto Kanavi means they go all in for it. It's oh, going to be. Soul. They got a 4v5 somehow stop this Baron, but Cloud Soul's going over. This Baron could be claimed. The rest of the squad's got to get there. Yagawa's around. Hope finds the damage. Odor will fight to live. It is a Baron versus a Dragon Soul. Where have we seen this before? Oh, right. Justin quarterfinals. T1 versus RNG. Another Cloud Soul traded for Baron. We will get to examine if it means as much in this game, where their gold is much closer. But off that respawn for T1, they shouldn't be able to get back and defend. Baron empowered recalls are so quick. They are on the way back down. Temporary combat power, very good, obviously, for T1. A bit of gold earned back. Half that gold for the Baron just clawed back thanks to the bot tier 2 kill. Zay is looking for his next target, will not find it just yet. You got pretty fast. The move speed from the Cloud Soul actually does mean a tremendous amount in a game like this, where so much is predicated on side lane pushing and picking people off. For sure. I think uh, the other thing I want to know is props to Yagao and what has been a very bloody game yet to die. And I think he's actually been a big difference maker in a lot of these fights because he's not the person getting focused, hope is. He's actually used a lot of his zone control to make it much harder for T1 to further follow up any initial picks that they're able to find. Looking at bot lane at tier one right now. No one remotely nearby the defendant is going to be given over. Gold will be shared by Carey as mid lane tier two is under fire as well. And despite being down the Baron, JDG, 4v5s, 3v5s, Baron buff, they're still the team playing aggressively and taking more turrets than T1 has taken. Yeah, it's looked like JDG getting a very, very good setup here. Not allowing T1 to get any gold out of this Baron. That Baron power play, one of the lowest that we have seen because they're able to hard push down mid, not give T1 any time to set up their split push. Off those recalls though, the bounce back for T1 allows them to push up through mid and rotate over. Still a close one, 1,000 gold separating these teams. T1 of course back ahead thanks to the Baron they had playing, Red Bull Baron power play, and still a minute left on the timer. Bot tier two under fire. Rizigan does not want the fight, and even though the wall comes down, they're not going to commit to the battle itself. They might just Galio. try now the knock back in. Here comes Galio. Will it be enough? Stopwatch buys time. Down goes one. Down goes two. And 36 9. And the rest of JDG are looking for a bit more. Amazing flash from Carry, but the chase is still on. Over the wall goes Kanavi. Wants to find his next stun. Here's the move speed in action. Thank you, Cloud Soul, for the cleanup. Kuma on his way out. Flash is burned to stay alive. But Yagao is not yet done. Side stepping away from the knock up. And finally, they will stop getting these. Kill. This T1 bottom lane are able to fend up all five JDG members as they kite away and buy Faker time to get an objective for themselves. Still pushing with the Baron, does get the tower. Beautifully done, gets the gold back to the spot here, but we got to play towards Faker. Burns his zone, his two minute cooldown, but will it matter? He will drop and the kill goes to Viego. It's still a great trade for T1 being able to secure that tower, but losing so many members, it seems they were caught unaware. Zayas underneath the tower. He ended up getting knocked up by Yagao. The ultimate cuts off their escape route. He gets a little too close, and you'll see the knockup come through. Beautifully played there by Yagao. Sets the lockdown, and JDG are quick. And look at the ultimate here from Hope as well, just tearing apart T1. Exactly. JDG, such a good job getting the engage under tower. Yagao showing his mastery of this Talia pick able to get, uh, catch the pick there onto Zeus and start it out. So then when they re-engage, T1 are fighting into the tower. Huge clump of damage there from Hope off the ultimate. Kuma Yushi, a lot of this damage that you're seeing is actually as they're escaping though, was not in the team fight, uh, able to get them any meaningful kills. A lot of damage while running away. And I credited Yagao for not dying earlier. Of course, Carrier yet to die in this game as well. And that's arguably even more impressive on Anami, a champion that doesn't have a huge amount of mobility or of tools to peel for himself. Carrier and Gumiyushi continue to have a stellar performance. Yep. Two deaths on Gumiyushi, so on a characteristic for him so far at this world, dying, uh, but he's still a massive carry threat. And he's someone you have to keep your eyes on. Pretty much full build now. Level 16 on the Lucian. He will be the biggest damage dealer on the side of T1 that JDG will have to be very wary of as we move forward into the upcoming fights. So fun watching these Titans go back and forth in these fights, in these picking moments. Only one of these outer towers still remains on the map left for them to take. So a lot of it is trying to get this deeper vision and then get just an extra second of alone time in an engage could mean the difference between life and death. 
between one of these side laners. Look at all the GAs that are now coming through. Kanavi, 369, and Hope all have that on the side of JDG. They are an incredible team fighting team. It is their team fighting that has helped them come back so many times in multiple domestic and international games. And now they will have many times to bounce back in these fights. Let's see how T1 handle it. Because it's going to make their pit comp inherently harder to execute in the upcoming fight. Baker, oh! in, taunts everybody, and it's GA already down. How does Hope have a chance of surviving this one? It's going to land, and Nagumo Yushi finds the cleanup kill. 45 seconds until Elder and Baron spawn. He who strikes first gets the rewards. T1 led by Faker. The GOATs get another pick for themselves. They take down the most important member and his G. What a great flash from Faker, completely catching Hope off guard. He wasn't even able to respond with the flash of his own. JDG was forced oh. to abandon him, and now 20 seconds on the Baron, 15 seconds on the Elder. T1 are primed and poised to secure these objectives that will likely decide the game. As we've seen, JDG winning team fights from a numbers disadvantage. 13 seconds on Hope. He will have to walk all the way from the fountain to be able to get there in time. Elder Dragon Marking started Baker. up. Not just yet, though. 12k health. Hope still in the fountain. Looking to play on in now towards Seiya's Can't find the kill just yet. Health bar's pretty high. Here comes the first dive. 369 out. Missing. Drops down to Guiyushi. Getting attacked himself, but he has GA. And they'll pop it off of the Jax now as well. 3v5 continues on, oh. Alapin pick goes Zeus, Kanavia one health, shut down, 369 goes for everything he can, and he can't find it, it's up to Hope, he lands the ulti, the snipe is not enough, it's not a crit, and Yagao now stuck in play, <laughs> Hope kills off Baker, Gumayushi kicked out now as well, Hope oh, has to get it all, gets one, shoots for Zeus, looks for two, not the rest Yagao. just yet, there's the wall, Yagao, he knocks down, and the white gun goes for more. Hope gets a red buff, fires off the snipe, and somehow JDG stopped the dragon. The most glorious blood battle I've seen around Elder Dragon on the world stage. And the Elder Dragon survives. Hope runs all the way back straight from the fountain out of this death timer to save the day for JDG. Look at JDG. They're going straight for the fight. They don't want to even play around with flipping this elder. Keep your eyes on Kumiyushi on the backside. Just obliterates missing. And then the rest of the team is like, peel for Kuma, peel for Kuma. Keep 369 off him. We okay. don't have time. We're back into the action free. Baker's still dead. Kuma's still dead. Yagao will have to run from the base, but they think, hey, you know what? 4v3 seems pretty good. Baker, Baker no ulti. He has to walk all the way over. Owner won the last smite fight. Will he get this one as well? Doesn't have the ward vision, but might try all the same. Oh, 369. 369 is gonna mark him, and that'll be enough to secure the Elder Dragon on to four. And JDG will cross the map and go again for Baron. Another time where if we go back to the origins of this play, it was the T1 pick onto Hope in mid lane that allowed them to set up the first Elder Dragon and result in JDG still getting the objective in the aftermath. This team will never give up. They will never say die. Unbelievable skill expression from both of these teams. We are witnessing some peak League of Legends right now. JDG will start off the Baron. The wall comes down. They use the front line, owner on the side now as well. 8k health up those winning galaxies. No one's behind the pit. It's all in the front. It's 369 again, marking the target. Owner comes in, he'll find a stun though. And keep oh. mind, they've got Elder. Hope can't find the first kill, but 369 does. Zeus will drop as well. It's two for nothing. And T1 runs for the hills. But 369 once more gets his second of the fight. Looks for Guma. The cooldowns are short. The leap is almost back. The cloud rift helping. And Galio jumps in to help. Two 2v1 going to be enough to push him away. Well, the thing for JDG is while the fight was good, they spent a lot of time just chasing the T1 members. They've only got a single cannon minion and two T1 members still stand strong. They're looking to push it to the base. They're, They're looking to the end base the game. Itself. They're going to try to end it. There are no TPs up, but they can shepherd the minion. Protect the cannon. Yeah, it's 5v2. It's, it's 5v2. And JDG wants the Nexus. This one will not respawn in time. No inhibitors. No champions and no hope jdg take game one the lpl champions so impressive they made their name in the lpl fighting these fights from behind overcoming odds
so many times in this particular game. Down in numbers in a team fight. Guess what? They don't care. They fight you off anyways. They still get the objective. They stack it. They trade the Dragon Soul for a Baron. They win the fight around the Elder and pick it up off the reset. Magnificent stuff here from the LPL champion. And so many great things from T1 as well. Yes, they ended up falling short at the very end, but the picks that they were able to find was so incredible because I thought it was only going to get harder for them. And then Faker finds the flash over the wall, gets the kill onto the AD carry. They're able to find picks onto to missing multiple times. The crowd looked like it was theirs. And there were so many moments against many other teams. T1 would have converted that pick into a win. But against yeah. JDG, that one pick, two pick, it was just not enough. The, the coordination on this JDG team in some of these team fights, counting the ultimates that are used to kill off their other members, still going to for the re-engage, down numbers, just beautiful stuff to see. I that mean, it's beautiful great. to see. Uh, <laughs> JDG also, like, they're the Island of Misfit toys. You look back at 369, you got cut from top esports. You look uh, down at Hope, he oh, went back and forth, got cut from WE. Uh, you were on EDG, then back to Academy, then back to EDG, back to Academy, cut from the team, joins EDG as well, and these squads came together to play a massive performance in game one. So JDG up 1-0 in this game. Now before we break down that game, a reminder that the LCS and LEC have joined forces once again to bring you the Dive for you podcast for Worlds. Catch up with the quarterfinals preview with Kobe, Dracos, and Kedril, and stay tuned for the finals episode dropping next week, available on Spotify. So queue up that episode and join us at the Analyst Desk. Thank you so much, Freak, and welcome back to the Analyst Desk here at the State Farm Arena, where the crowd has rightfully erupted for that first game in the best of uh, five. <laughs> I just want, yeah, I'm so glad it's not my job to analyze, and that's yeah. for you three to do, because I just want to watch four more of those. That's all I want is four more of those, but JDG getting it done in game number one. All I'm saying is, oh, yeah, it's a, for those that don't know, yeah, guys, <laughs> my name means toothpaste, and... We didn't talk about him much in the opening, right? Uh, we did talk about how it was Faker and the Zoomers. We talked about Kanavi. We didn't really talk about Yagao. And I think this Talia pick for JDG was a key factor in their win. Not only the way he played it, but the way it went into what uh, T1 wanted to do. I, a lot of the members of JDG feel so easy to overlook it kind of in that regard. For example, Yagao is 16th out of 16th mid laners. It's yep. CSD at 15. Right. It doesn't matter. That's, cause that's not what's important for how he plays the game. And Talia is just kind of this perfect pick to exemplify how he wants to approach the game. Yeah, definitely. And then that's what he picked on four there. We can see the draft on the lower half of the screen. I think the first one, two, three was very standard. You know, Lucian, Nami, Aphelios, mm -hmm. trade, jungle trade of uh, Viego and Vi. But it's, it's, the, it's the four, five from T1 that kind of throw a, a wrench into the works. It was interesting that they actually decided to go for Camille Gallio into Talia. You know, Talia is very good at dashing champions. And you're playing three melee champs in Vi, Gallio, and, um, and Camille dashing into, into a Talia. So it's very hard to gap close. But T1 found so many picks. I think JDG's response is very natural. Jax into Camille Gallio makes a lot of sense. You have double global mid to match the side lane. I think what JDG answered here with was very good. Uh, I mean, generally, there were winning moments for both teams, right, mm -hmm. throughout the game. And, and, but I'm curious, Kajal, your thoughts on essentially T1 saying, yes, we'll take that Talia play style you know, to go to the sidelines and we'll match it with the Galio, as opposed to going to some of those more prevalent picks that we've seen in the mid lane, you know, early on in the tournament. I think it makes a lot of sense to go to the Galio, Camille, because what you're running is a Nami. So this was pre-planned by T1, regardless of what JDG threw at them, I think, because the whole idea, and we'll see it later on in the fights, is you Camille Galio ult onto a target, immobile AD carry of Aphelios, great, that's your main target, Lulu can work as well, but the Nami ult is what seals the deal on top of that, right? You can never really assist your AD carry or try to gap close towards him to try to peel, because there's a Nami ult over the top of the Camille <laughs> Galio, right? So it was an incredible, incredible <laughs> All game. That and of course, look at Faker, greatest, you know, Galio 2017 series yeah, against I, RNG. That's exactly where I was about to go. There's all these great points you're making about the current game, but there's also the historical <laughs> angle. Just Faker is synonymous with probably the greatest Galio performances you've ever seen in that 2017 RNG series, playing it five times in a row and carrying his team on his back. He tried to do it again in this game. He had some absolutely <laughs> monstrous plays, but just couldn't get it done in the end. Yeah, this pick on Hope is actually where I thought uh, T1 were going to end up taking over the game. He has such great sense uh, with this Galio pick. And I also like the Camille Galio kind of to mitigate how JDG like to play the map, right? Because we've talked about how they don't necessarily get ahead, but the globals help counter and cross map against what JDG want to do. JDG fighting a man down in, in this oh, situation. Yeah. I mean, just like, it's pure aggression all the time. You got to love it. The number of summoners blown, the amount of mechanics on display yeah. here on both sides of the coin, Kadrill. 
Defense is phenomenal. This was an amazing game to watch. Just pure mechanics and pure perfection almost in team fights, right? And again, we see another scenario where T1 are down members. This is a 3v5, but they managed to stop it here. That Talia E over the Baron pit wall stops mm -hmm. Gumayushi from being able to dash over. It stops Zeus there with the Baron. I think that was a knock or it was the Talia E, whatever it was. So it's actually a 3v3 into an Aphelio. So they inevitably lost this, but we had so many scenarios where T1 would win the fight by getting a pick with Camille Gallio and Nami Ult on midwave. JDG here overstepping med. Yep. So many. This is like the second or third time that Hope's over stepping, but then they seem to be able to pull it back every single time. Yeah, it's absolutely insane that they get this pick off. They're like, great, now we get to go Elder Dragon, and mm -hmm. JDG are able to fight so well that they stall out and wait for him to come back and then win that fight on the tail end of it. And then once they won that and they got the Elder from there, it was a little bit easier to close out. Yeah, and this is kind of the, the game-winning fight here. That's where I do want to bring it back to that Talia pick and Yago, right? Because we talk about him. He's not this, like, standout carry player of JDG. He's often overlooked against other LPL mids. He's lived in the shadows of his friend Knight for almost his entire career when they used to play on the net cafe team. And the way he set up for a lot of these plays, like not allowing T1 to jump on them is really important. Also, you can see the... Look at that gold yeah. graph. <laughs> it, the, the gold graph was so it's even great, up until around. Yeah. I mean, even the end of the game, 4.5K is not that huge of a lead after you just smash a base. You know, usually it just drops to like 8K. And so this was an insanely close game. I think everyone with eyes could tell that. We don't <laughs> stats uh, assist, but I can't wait for more of this series. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think if you look at the way T1, uh, sorry, JDG was playing the game, it was always mid to top. And I felt like <laughs> T1 were never really there to respond in time. You saw Zeus on the weak side, right? But they never really found any big cross maps. There was one Hextech Dragon, but it was often times when they did go towards the top side that Kumiyoshi was getting dove in the 2v1, right? So I felt like both side lanes, despite the early game being quite even, JDG were being a little bit more proactive. I would love to see a little bit more focus actually around Guma. There was that <laughs> one play in the top side where they contested 3v2 to stop the Rift Herald charge and try and stop that turret from going down. They actually had owner already on the bot side and Faker could have gone to that down to there and try and blow that open. I, I mean, Guma was incredible this game, despite not being the focus of a lot of the action in the early game. Let me press you on that just a little bit. T1 sticking to blue side. When you say playing around him a little bit more, just in the game more or a comp positionally as well. More in-game. I mean, okay. top lane is, is <laughs> going to become a black hole of attention no matter what, because it's so so skillful and, and you want to try and snowball, but I do think you have this kind of X-factor in Guma. Especially with a volatile lane like the Lucian Nami, right? Like, mm. we, when you want to get that lane ahead, you can take over, start Drake stacking, and in this case, it was actually JDG that were able to get their own Drake stacking started early. So the T1 didn't always have that bot side control that they might have wanted. The, the last thing I will say, it's, it's very interesting that T1's banning Aatrox on blue side, right? They just want this champion removed. So I wonder if they'll do that again or if they will you know, play a game of bluff, a game of chicken up yeah. against JDG and say if you unban Graves, well, first pick it, if both are open, could ca cause a mayhem. Aatrox has been sucked into that black hole of the top lane, as Mark put it. We'll see if he can find his way out of it. Check out T1's very own song, Runner, as the pick that represents their play style on the official LOL playlist on Spotify. Take a listen. We'll see you right back here for game number two, right after this. It's going to be the first one missing heal for move speed. Flash it himself. Double, not an ulti, but enough damage is going to be there. The Polymorph, first blood for Gumayushi. He won the second. Pin health runs at about half HP. Smite is up on both sides. Faker dives in, and the rest of the squad comes by. Economy's rash of the way. Burning down with the red. Wants the kill. He can't. Three six nine again, marking the target. Owner comes in, he'll find a stun though. And keep in oh. mind, they've got Elder. Hope can't find the first give a three six nine does. Zeus will drop as well. It's two for nothing. And T1 runs for the hills. Behind 21 epic days of epicness. Behind one billion hours of drop jewels. Behind every match, every broadcast, every moment at League of Legends World Championship 2022 is the network capable of making it all happen. The Cisco Network, a.k.a. The Realm. Cisco, powering the future of esports.
care much for your kind of wisdom, ye. Red Bull gives you wings.